Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. There is a right to freedom of expression. It's in the European uh, Charter of Human Rights. It's in the British Human Rights Act. It's in the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights. There, there is no right to be heard. Uh, you don't have to sit here and listen to me. You can walk out, you can put your earplugs in. Uh, you don't have to buy certain newspapers and, and so on. Um, freedom of expression, according to these charters and declarations and, and so on, um, those charters do say under very strict and limited circumstances. Uh, it is possible to limit speech on occasions. Gov governments are not necessarily contravening those charters. Um, but it has to be necessary, it has to be proportionate, it has to be the least restrictive approach you could use. And even with that language, I think we're, we're in dangerous territory here, because as soon as you start to limit speech, you're on a very, very slippery, slippery slope. It, it is true that there's a lot of very nasty hate speech out there and racist speech out there. And I, I was looking uh, this evening, there's a very good report by the UN Special Rapporteur on Free Expression, Frank LaRue, that came out last September on hate speech. And he says he thinks around the world there's an increase in hate speech, and that's very worrying. But I think we also see, which to me is, is also very worrying, there's an increased intolerance of, of offence. And there is no right not to be offended. And whether we're defending Salman Rushdie's right to be printed or the innocence of Muslims to go on YouTube. If we're all going to demand that we mustn't be offended, then, then we're going to live in a world where our freedom of speech is ever more restricted. And, and where do we draw the line is perhaps the question between offence, grossly offensive, hate speech, incitement to violence, where I would draw the line at incitement to violence. I think what we shouldn't be doing is risking criminalizing speech. If we criminalize speech, we're, we're heading in the wrong direction. In this country, in, in the last year or two, we've seen some extraordinary criminal prosecutions of people for making offensive remarks on Facebook or Twitter, sometimes racist, sometimes religiously offensive. Um, we've actually got new guidelines from the Director of Public Prosecutions, Keir Starmer, trying to restrict and rein in those prosecutions, um, but because they're too many, because they're taking simple social media conversations and treating them as if they're something offensive um, on the BBC. How, how do you actually tackle racism or hate speech? Do you do it by closing it down? Or do you do it by opening, opening it up and using that free speech? Because we have confidence in that free speech, and it's through that confidence that, that we think we can actually get to, the, to this situation we want to be in. I think it's that issue from offence, grossly offence, hatred, incitement to violence, from having a conversation in your front room to having a conversation on this stage. We're at our strongest if we have the conversation. I don't think freedom of speech and freedom of racist speech is quite the same thing as the right to be heard. And I think the right to be heard which is the question we're primarily discussing tonight, is saying something about the public spaces we share and what is heard in those spaces that we share. It seems to me we don't uh, offer racists the right to make monkey chants in the football stadium and to stay and watch the football match. We used to do that. There has been an enormous cultural shift on the racist right to be heard. But if we disagree about the culture shift, and I say, excuse me, the monkey chants, I'm here with my children, don't really want to hear it, and they say, sorry, the monkey chants really matter to me, I want to chuck another banana. We might need to have a rule at the bottom there. The banana isn't an act of violence, but you know, John Barnes' right to uh, go to his workplace without having to backheel a banana off the pitch, and my right to go with my children, in the end, trump that. So we underpin that culture shift with an anti-racist rule that at bottom we enforce. And then that we don't have to enforce anymore because the culture changed. Britain has done better, I think, than most other countries in developing this anti-racist norm. 
To extend it, we don't give more platforms to racism and let racism be heard more in our public space. But we mustn't do something else either. We mustn't ask too much of the anti-racist norm. We mustn't use the anti-racist norm to say that's racist. When people are saying things that aren't racist, people are trying not to be racist, but they want to talk about immigration, they want to talk about integration, they want to talk about identity, they want to talk about the way their country's changed. They should be allowed to do all of these things without people saying that's racist. So in order to protect our anti-racist norm, let's not give more rights to racists to be heard, but let's make sure people have a right to be heard without being racist and make sure that they've got the space to adopt the boundary. And one thing we good liberals can do is stop using the phrase dog whistling for people who aren't being... It's a very big charge, dog whistling. If you're saying dog whistling, you're saying you're a cynical person who's appealing to racism. There isn't much racism out there anymore, as much as there was. David Cameron and Ed Miliband make speeches about immigration. They're not dog whistling, they're talking about immigration. The right response is to say, I don't agree with you about immigration. Not, you're dog whistling, that's a cynical appeal to racism. So let's not give racists more space, but let's give people more space to talk about things that are difficult, that matter, without being racist. Thank you. Racists certainly do have a moral right to be heard or at least to speak not everywhere not at any in any situation in the workplace but there must be somewhere for racists to speak i mean it's part of our human rights everybody has a human right to speak i believe um no matter how abhorrent their views the point where you stop racists is the point where they incite violence and that is completely context dependent so it's not a matter of the particular words or symbols that they use, it's the context in which they use them. That's the performance that they make by uttering those words in a particular um, situation which, which can be seen to incite violence. The great value of the free speech of racists for us is that it stops us holding anti-racism as a prejudice. So I'd like to draw on John Stuart Mill's views here to support this. John Stuart Mill, great um, defender of liberty, in on liberty and of freedom of speech, argued that it's not just what you believe, it's how you hold those beliefs that matters. Dogmatic beliefs, which aren't questioned, which aren't, aren't challenged, have little value. It's through the collision with somebody who really is a racist, I think, that any anti-racist views become strengthened, not through mixing just with people who happen to share your views. So although you may be disgusted by racist utterances, the fact that they exist and, and utter those things helps you to be clearer in your views. And it is the kind of stimulus that makes people act as well. I get enraged by certain sorts of views. It's at that point I'm capable of actually of, of doing something rather than just chatting about it. So that's one aspect of, of the importance of, of allowing racists a chance to speak in some context. And given the internet, we don't have to give them a platform. We don't have to publish them. They'll find their own way to publish their ideas in ways, in ways that they'll be available to other people. But there's another element as well. There's, I believe in the hydraulic model of, of uh, racism and other things. If you push them down, they pop up somewhere else. It's no good just stopping people saying things. And actually speaking is a lot better than, than violence. Uh, you stop someone saying something in public, it's going to pop up somewhere else. They're going to be saying it in private. You'll make them into martyrs or quasi-martyrs. And it will give them more power thinking that they are actually um, the scum of the earth, so they ought to get together as the scum of the earth and do something really serious. What we have to do is meet racism with counter-speech. That's what I think the great value of freedom of speech is. It gives us a public forum with a spoken word we can negotiate, argue, not necessarily face-to-face, -face, but in uh, print, on web blogs, in, in, on television, platforms like this. We can address the kind of arguments that we've heard. So I think... Actually, along with Mill, the voices of dissent, and here the voices of dissent, I would agree, are on the whole racist ones. They're a minority, let's hope, but they are very common still racist views. These are the things that will actually provoke us into clarifying what we really believe as liberals and why we value the kind of society that we're trying to promote. So despise racists, but acknowledge that they have a practical value and their freedom is part of freedom of speech, which itself is a huge value within a democracy. In principle, of course, there's freedom of expression. But I agree with Sundar that there's a distinction to be made between freedom of expression and the freedom to be heard. There's also a distinction between allowing uh, people the freedom to be heard and actually promoting 
or celebrating um, a diversity of views for the sake of celebrating the diversity of views. I think that granting racists the right to be heard, as it's been put here, creates legitimacy. Yes, I think it does. I think in certain platforms, in certain contexts, it is quite clear that the very nature of the place in which racists are allowed to speak mainstreams these opinions, mainstreams these views. And to some extent, it's true that we may all be disgusted, uh, as Nigel said, uh, with what is being said. But I think that one of the things that we tend to underestimate is not just that racist language and racist views are disgusting, is that they can be crushing. They can administer crushing blows. They can actually contribute to depriving perhaps some of the more marginalized elements of society from enjoying the freedom that we would be so prompt in granting racists. So I think we need to be careful here. I think we need to be careful about theorizing a little bit too much, about etherealizing what racist language and what uh, racist views actually are. Uh, they, they are acts, they are, they are crushing. I think the notion that we build effectively counter speech, uh, as, as it's been termed, is actually not quite true. It's not quite there. I think if racism has fallen in our societies, um, it is essentially down to a lot of other actions rather than the fallacy that because in some cases at some points we granted uh, some platforms and had you know, a good old fashioned debate with some racists that this actually uh, contributed terribly much to really um, impeding the progress of, of racist views. Most of us, whatever you, you want to call us, progressives, liberals, most of us are actually bound by a standard of debate that um, I would say that most racist opponents are absolutely unencumbered by. Um, and the, the situation that is often faced by those of us who take them on is that we are cornered into an impossible choice. We are cornered into allowing them to, to lie, to manipulate, because as I said, they are unimpeded by some of the debating standards that most of us uh, would abide by, or we join them because we can't beat them, and then we essentially delegitimize our own position. So I think that we have to think very, very carefully about whether or not we can actually, in public, build that counter speech. I'm very doubtful about it. Should we engage with people whose views we, with people whose views we don't agree with, uh, with people who we might find offensive? Yes, absolutely. Should we do it necessarily in public with an audience on uh, on hallowed platforms? I would actually uh, disagree with that. But obviously, um, in engaging in uh, in different ways uh, is 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 the right thing to do. Thank you. Catherine said that racist speech is, is crushing, and you admitted that uh, there are limits to free speech uh, around uh, incitement to violence, etc. cetera. Isn't, isn't racist speech a kind of violent speech that doesn't, that doesn't deserve uh, a space to be aired in the public, in the public sphere? I, I don't, I, I'm very nervous of suggesting that just speech, any speech from an individual, is, is the same as an act of violence, of, of course you, and we have laws uh, uh, in, in terms of um, harassment, stalking, bullying, and, and so on, but th those are laws that go well beyond just saying something that's insulting or offensive or, or nasty. And we cannot defend our society that has free speech in it if we don't have a certain amount of thick skins. Interesting to me that in what Sunda said, he said, well, of course, we must still debate immigration, that, yeah, and he's quite right. Of course we must d debate immigration. Um, and then he said, and a good way to do that is you mustn't call your opponents racists. But I think a lot of people, um, nice white liberal middle class people I hear in the UK saying control immigration are racists and they're in denial on that. So I'm very nervous about saying you mustn't call them such and such or should we ban parties? And, and you've both said you know, that racism has come down, and that came down without 
banning platforms for racists. It came down because we had a debate with Enoch Powell and his rivers of blood. And, and so let's have a bit more confidence in ourselves. Do you not think racists are, are useful to anti-racists? Let's engage them in discussion and, and show up their, their fallacies and their... I and think, their shortcomings? I wouldn't do what, what you, know, you can do at the extreme in Germany of, say, the, the racist party can't stand for election, because I, I want to see the truth, which is that it can't win a seat anywhere at all. So I want to see that uh, and to have that debate there. But they have to actually earn... If they earn uh, some of the hallowed platforms, you actually get elected to the House of Commons, you can speak in the House of Commons, and you'll actually have to trigger some rights to speak on the BBC. But until you've done that, actually, um, if the BNP, for example, has no seats at all uh, in 2014, and we have a fascist-free zone of elected office in Britain uh, after the next European elections, which no other European uh, country has, you don't have to have Nick Griffin uh, on, the, uh, on the BBC. And, and therefore, you shouldn't, while he's uh, you know, losing in that way. And call people racist if they're racist. But if you're a liberal and someone doesn't agree with you, don't say you're a closet racist unless it really is motivated by racism and you can catch someone in the act of racism because it, you're, pushing the, you're pushing the reasonable conversation you should have. There's less racism there and you should challenge hard old biological racism and then you should work out how to engage the anxieties that a lot of people will feel and push the rejectionist racism to the fringes of the public discussion. Nigel, do you, do you think that that Nick Griffin should be on Question Time uh, like, like he was just before the, uh, the last election. Um, does that give him a, a, a kind of legitimacy that we, that we wouldn't want to, want to give to racists? Should we, should we not give a platform well, to that? He ridiculed himself. If we did, if he, he, I doubt if he would come back, given the, the fool he made of himself in public. And that was a, an example. That's an example of being on the same platform. That's not what I was arguing for, actually. What I was suggesting was that racists have a right to be heard, a right to speak, it doesn't mean that you have to give them a platform. It doesn't mean that you have to be addressing them face to face. I'd like to take up this whole issue about earning the right to speak. We see all the time rhetoric, poor arguments, personal abuse in the, in, in the highest chamber. These are views which are part of the political environment in which we live, and we need to react to them. We need to know what they are. We need to be able to hear them. We need to be able to engage with them and hope that we don't press them down with the, the force of the law and, and encourage people to, to use violence because they've lost their voices. You, describe, you seem to be describing a very thin right, that people have the rights, but then you wouldn't invite them to any platform that, that you were well, that's on. That's the question. That's a personal decision on my part. So, so people have the right, but functionally, we never hear from, from racists. Well, Richard Dawkins that, talked about um, this in relation to debating cre creationists face-to-face. A number of creationists got annoyed that they were never invited to these biological, zoological conferences on evolution. And Richard Dawkins' point was, well, that would look great on your CV, but terrible on mine. <laughs> and the point is that platforms do give certain sorts of credibility to people. There are different conventions about the meaning of being on a platform. And you don't necessarily want to do that. That doesn't mean those people can't express their views. Dawkins isn't saying creationists shouldn't be allowed to express their views in any, position, in any place. He doesn't want them in schools. It doesn't mean they can't have their websites. I think we've got this a very strange view uh, about platforms, and we're hearing about hallowed platforms, almost some elitist ranking of platforms. That's why, that's why I was pushing Sunder briefly on, he seemed to say it was perfectly all right, the racists could have a right to be heard online, but this is our digital times. This is what's opened out and hugely democratised our public space, made it harder for China, for instance, to suppress free speech because of their micro-blogging communities. If Nick Griffin and the BMP has a legal right in this country to stand for election, then yes, he should actually be on those BBC platforms. So we have anti-discrimination laws, and we now have race and religious hatred laws, and we can debate if we think those laws should exist. But you've got laws. Once you've got those laws, why would you democratically not have the BMP on your platform? This idea that, um, in a sense, all platforms, because we live in a digital age, are, are created equal. And I just, I just don't think so. I think, yes, there is a hierarchy of, of platforms, because some platforms are representative of institutions and laws. They are, in a sense, a representation of society at a given point and time. And therefore, um, uh, without, it's not really a question of elitism, it's really a question of holding them as, as representative. And so I think that um, 
being expressing certain views um, in within platforms in institutions that are precisely designed to enshrine to enshrine the collective norms that we say we value yes it has a particular role and yes it is different uh, from from the uh, from online platforms which are which are fantastic I, I'm not you know I'm not disputing either their importance or their or their purchase but I am d disputing in a sense um, their status as collectively recognized um, platforms that enshrine what we as societies value. Um, it's clear uh, from, from my perspective that, that while racism exists and, it affects, and its effects are so widespread and damaging, we have to do something about it. Um, this debate, I hope, has, has, has helped to illuminate some of the challenges in doing something about it uh, and how we engage people uh, in that discussion.